leadership is corrupt. Mm -hmm. Not the people. Well, why don't we pray about all that right now and then start, I guess. A few missing six people, but maybe they're not going to come. I don't know. God, uh, thank you that you're in control of all things, and we trust that whatever's going on uh, in the Middle East, that you will work it out according to your will and your pleasure. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, so Esther, um, as always, when I think I know a book very well and I start studying and preparing, I learn a lot, so that's exciting, also keeps it fresh. Uh, first page of your notes, question, why study Esther? It does not mention God's name, ever. Why might that be? Why might the author choose to not mention God? The author uh, just assumes that you know that God is on the side of the Israelis and just never you know, mentions it in the book. Because it's just assumed because, you know, okay. it's Good. Um, does it benefit the book in any way to avoid mentioning his name? Not just name, but like God is not his name, but his name or his title, Yahweh or God. Refers to obeying. Maybe that they are, they just, they know they don't have to mention the name. Well, okay. They're persecuting the Christians too. The Jews? Well, just in general, in the world. You know, that's what I'm saying. Maybe, maybe there was a fear there. Of, some kind. of course, they were in later. <clears throat> um, you're saying maybe the author didn't guess. yeah um, I guess uh, I was imagining that the book wouldn't circulate far beyond Jewish circles um, <clears throat> I wonder I never really thought about that whether or not pagans thought I'm going to read the Jewish scriptures and see what they say I don't I don't know um, yeah. Well, I think he didn't mention God because he wanted to draw attention to the fact that it was just assumed, to strengthen the concept and reconfirm the fact that the Jews were God's chosen people. Because he didn't, I think he specifically didn't do, do that for that very same reason. That was the reason he did it. It's not anywhere in that the name. <coughs> Good. Anything else? Any other? Well, even then, like you can work through pagans. To bring about his will. And, um, yeah. Who wrote Esther? We don't know. Don't know. It's, it's anonymous. I read in common, I think it's commentary tradition. Mordecai? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there is um, there's a reference at the end to Mordecai recording some of the events, but not anything about him writing the book or telling the whole story. Um, so it could have, I certainly. There. I mean, I knew it didn't fail. Yeah, um, so it could be. Um, but there's some other reasons that make it seem like maybe more time has elapsed between the, the events taking place and the book being written. You know, like there was a lot of time between the creation of the world and when Moses wrote Genesis thousands of years. So when the things take place and when they're written down are two different time periods, <clears throat> usually. I was just wondering, I mean, the Jewish, it doesn't seem like the Jewish people were being persecuted up to, to that point. And since they were in captivity, was, were they really worshiping God at that time? I mean, had, was it still? You mean why didn't Esther and Mordecai go back with Ezra? Yeah, I, I just, you know, that's why I was thinking that's why they didn't mention God. The people really talk about God, the ones that were still living there. Um, was it part of, of uh, well, did they worship? I mean, did they worship? I, 
Yeah, um, this is a one of the few windows we have into the lives of Jews who didn't go back. We have Ezra and Nehemiah and some of the prophets about the ones who went back. Uh, this is one of the few ways to see. So uh, clearly some still did. Um, but there's a lot of questions about that. Um, doesn't look like they're following kosher laws. I mean, doesn't seem like Esther is. Um, there's, there's a whole lot of questions. Um, and the book is purposefully ambiguous about certain things. Um, and what does that ambiguity do? Uh, maybe ambiguous isn't the right word, but purposefully doesn't say a lot of things. Uh, God's name is not mentioned for some of the reasons said, but also because, two reasons, um, it's a lot like our life, right? Things happen, and God doesn't say, that one was from me. I, I wanted you to stub your toe because I wanted to humble you. And then he doesn't other times say, no, that was your fault. You were texting while you drove, so I didn't cause that accident. He doesn't say. Things happen, and we have to figure it out. Right? So the book of Esther is a lot more like our everyday life than like the book of Acts, where God is doing awesome things. Um, <clears throat> in other words, God's actions, we just have to, we have to discern what God's doing behind the scenes. So, um, so that helps us relate to the book of Esther. Also, I think the author is forcing us to do that activity of going, huh, how, did God, did God cause that to happen? Um, and, and that activity of the way the book is designed, there are there's certain things that are obvious and there's certain things that make you go, wait a minute, was that person's reason this or that? Was that a good thing to do? Was that a bad thing? There's all these things like that and that activity of asking those questions strengthens a certain muscle in your brain of looking at things and thinking, wait a minute, does this mean this or that? Or that? And that... that skill that you learn from studying this book translates into everyday life. Right? Mm -hmm. um, we're going to see today in chapter 1 uh, when Vashti um, you know, does that her big thing of not coming. Um, it's like the only thing she does in the whole book. She doesn't come. Um, <clears throat> uh, when he calls her. It doesn't say why. And there's a lot of speculation why. But that's what happens in everyday life. If somebody does something, and you can't see their motives. <clears throat> um, so, uh, while I'm on, up on this soapbox, uh, let me <clears throat> say this. Um, often, when we read the Old Testament, we're really quick to jump to a moral meaning immediately. And... Have you ever noticed that when you read a t story in the Old Testament, uh, you the moral meanings are kind of filtered through the New Testament, right? Like if you said, oh, David was a man after God's heart, so I should imitate him. So that means if I like this woman, I can kill her husband and marry her. Well... Obviously not. So what we say is, we say, well, okay, here's the story of a, somebody's life in the Old Testament. And <clears throat> so they have events, well, they have different events, and we say, well, some of them you should imitate, and some of those you should not imitate. And where are we getting that? From the epistles, and from the Sermon on the Mount and the teachings of Jesus and the apostles. So we have these New Testament teachings that say, do A and B, 
and don't do Y and Z. Right? And we know that. So when we read a story and we see a character doing A and B and we see them also doing Y and Z, we take the New Testament teachings and just put it on top and we say, look, I'm learning from the Old Testament because I should do this and this and I should not do this and this. So David, when he fights Goliath, has faith and I know from the New Testament that faith is good, so I should imitate him there. You're not learning anything from the Old Testament if you do it that way. Right? You could do that with a story in the newspaper. Does that make sense? So, instead of taking other information and putting it into the story, we want to let the story do what it wants to do and teach us what it wants to teach us. Right? So, um, that's why it's very important not to read a story and think, what's the moral lesson here? Because it might not have the moral lesson you expect it to have. Um, this is what you should do. Okay? Instead of... Where's the... Uh, instead of putting those New Testament labels on it, you see this, all these events in this story, say, ah, I wonder why he does that. I wonder, I wonder what that means. I wonder why, hmm. And if you do this, it makes you go, well, what could her reasons be? I guess it could be such and such, or, or maybe it's something else. Or maybe it's something else. And you have just, I don't know. I don't know which it is, but it could, uh, it could be, there's a lot of things it could be. And you're reading the story, and you're reading the story, and you may, uh, and over the course of that, be like, you know what, it definitely couldn't be this one. That doesn't make any sense with the story. And then, another part of the story, you're like, well, is this, you know, X, Y, or Z, this could be these things. I can't think of any other reasons why that could be. And then you can start to go, as you're reading the story over and over and thinking about it, you start to go, well, let's see, if, this, if it's this for that action, how does that change the whole story? Well, if that's true, then it, then it would have to be this one there or that one, but it couldn't be that if that's... And so you, you have all these questions, right? Did you ever wonder why Psalm 1 says... Blessed is the man who meditates in the law day and night. Like, how do you meditate in a day and night if it's just a list of moral rules? But if it's stories like this, which the majority of the Bible is stories like this, and the majority of the stories don't have any kind of... The author doesn't say at the end, like Aesop's fables. So the moral of the story is, don't get jealous of your brother and kill him. It doesn't say that at the end. It just says, this is what happened. And you're left with all these questions. Why did he do that? So, that yes. Um, you know, that's true. I, I hadn't really thought about that. We do use old Testament morals looking with New Testament principles. I mean, I do it myself. But on our trip, that came up several times that our guide never said anything bad about the Bible. He was a, a Jewish convert. But he would say, just like places and things, we think this in the Bible, but it would make more sense if, you know, with the geography of the land and things like that, that he made us think. Yeah. Um, and the exercise of going through that and thinking about it is part of what the author wants you to learn. Not just information, but the skills. If this is how you, if you read a book, it could be any book, it could be Ruth, it could be stories in Genesis. If this is how you read them, and you're thinking about it, what would that give you? What would that do to your mind? What skill or ability are you exercising when you do that? There's a word for it in the Bible, but 
You don't have to have the exact word. Mm, yeah, but when you, what do you call it? Yes, it is. What do you call it when you interpret things in everyday life? Like if you see Ruth get up and walk out of the room, you make an interpretation. I just assume, well, you know, maybe she has a, got a text and she has to leave. Yeah, but you're being presumptuous. Yeah, I make an interpretation. I assume she has some good reason. She's not mad at me. She has some good reason. So maybe you are mad at me, and I assumed wrong. But, right, we, we, have, to, we have to do that. Now, if it ends up being a big deal, I might start to say, you know what? Maybe there was another reason that person did that. We call that discernment in the Bible. You look at things and you don't know the whole story. You don't know all the facts. You just have to discern them. And if you jump to conclusions when you're reading the Bible, you probably are going to jump to conclusions in everyday life and get wrong interpretations. Yes? This is a question. I was reading the first um, chapter of the book and you're talking about the king, mm -hmm. extravagant abuses and celebrations. And then we hear about him disposing of the queen because she didn't obey him. That would lead me to believe that one of the reasons was she didn't like the fact that he was not humble at all. He was excessive in his power and his celebrations. And that was the reason that she didn't obey him because she just wasn't going to be that type of queen to be correct him. Yeah, so, good. So, this is what we do when we're, when we're going to get into all every verse, hopefully, of chapter 1. But when we get to that, we, in our either physical notebook or mental notebook, we say, okay, why did Vashti do what she did? Option A. She, she knew the kind of guy he was. I mean, she was married to him. And she had been fed up. I mean, she had known him for years, and she had been fed up. That's option A. She's just fed up with his um, abuses. Maybe. Is there any other possible reason? If we come up with one, we write that down, and we just leave those all as possibilities on the table. It doesn't mean they're all right. Maybe he wasn't faithful. Well, <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're going to get to that. How are you going to sub it for 12 days? Yeah, but, but I'm just saying that's, that's mm -hmm. there's mine. Uh, yeah, I mean, as we learn in chapter 2, he's not the faithful kind of guy. Right. I mean, you know that the beauty pageant was a sex pageant, if you read it carefully. So, um, that's definitely a possibility. Maybe, you know, he's got this guy has a hundred wives and or concubines or whatever. Yeah, okay, so good. Another option. Maybe it's that. So when you leave those out on the table, um, you're reading through, let's, and that's what you do. You move on and you get, oh, I'm learning what kind of guy this is. Which one of these options fits him and the whole story the best? Um, and so as you're reading this, that's why I recommend picking a book of the Bible and reading that book over and over and over again for a while, um, and then moving on to something else. But then, you know, a year later you're going to come back to that book, or years later, depending on how long you spend on each book. But, and, and over the course of your life you're going to go deeper and deeper and deeper and un be able to rule things out. And when you do that, you'll start to you'll start to say, hey, you know what? I always thought it was this, but there's another possibility for that one near the end of this story. It could be any, any story in, in, the, in the Bible. There's this H, we'll call it. If it's that, that makes so much more sense of this section that always puzzled me. And it makes so much... And so sometimes, sometimes, you get this moment when you all the pieces start to fall into place. Click, 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 click. 
Oh, those are fun moments. They don't happen very often in your life, but they're only going to happen if you don't jump to a moralizing conclusion. Um, and then there's other times when it happens slowly, and slowly, as you study a book over and over it, throughout the course of your life, different things, sections fall into place and you start to understand. Okay, I'm going to get off that soapbox and we're going to move. Um, but that's great because we weren't really taught to do that. When I was growing up, you took the Bible literally, you read it, and you didn't question anything. And I love this. Yeah, well, it's not a questioning whether or not it's true. It's no, questioning no, what does God want to teach me? That. Yeah, right. we just wanted to assume right. what God wanted to teach us. I know, I know, um, but as it's imp it is important. Mm -hmm. So um, we're going to skip the overview. Um, I was going to do the overview on that page, but um, we have other weeks to do that. We want to get into chapter one. So let's go to the second page, and um, let's read verses one through eight. Does anyone need a paper Bible? I have... Uh, I have a few here, and I have more up there, large print. Everybody good with the Bible they have? Okay. <clears throat> All right, would anyone like to read verses 1 through 8 for us? Who will? All right. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, this is Ahasuerus, which reads name from India, even into Ethiopia, over 107 and 20 provinces. And in those days, when the king Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the palace, in the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto all his princes and his servants, the power of Persia and Medea, the nobles and princes of the provinces being before him. When he showed the riches of his, of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty, many days, even a hundred and fourscore days, and when these days were expired, the king made a feast unto all the people that were present in Shushan, the palace, both, both unto great and small, seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace, where were white, green, and blue hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rings and pillars of marble. The beds were gold and silver upon a pavement of red and blue and white and black marble. And they gave them and they gave them drink in the vessel of gold, the vessels being diverse one from another, and royal wine in abundance according to the state of the king. And the drinking was according to the law, none did compel, for so the king had appointed to all the officers of his house that they should do according to every man's pleasure. Okay. <clears throat> so Anyone have any um, impressions or questions about first just the story of what what just happened? He was very much in the material things, possessions. <clears throat> yeah, very lavish party. Mm -hmm. This is an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> understatement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, <clears throat> side note. Um, he also was allowing his guests to, especially when it says they were allowed to just drink the way they wanted to, because weren't there laws in, um, in the land? Uh, typically, like typically, from what I've read, um, they would, there was like a Toastmaster, and they'd be like, here, here, and everyone would drink, and then you would wait, and then whatever was going on, I mean, it was a big display of wealth. Um, so, um, but he's made a law that, no, we're not doing that. You just, people are drinking they want to do it. however they want to do it. <clears throat> um, it was, let's see what it says. Um, <clears throat> um, verse 4, for a full 180 days he displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and glory of his majesty. So uh, it's possible that he calls all these leaders from all over his huge empire um, to show his wealth and at the end they have a seven-day banquet. 
Um, it's a little bit unclear, and you'll see different versions will interpret that different ways. Um, but um, that's the general idea, and it's a vast display of wealth. By the way, when Alexander the Great eventually took over this empire, he went to this very place, and he looked in the treasury. Do you know how much money he found? Uh, he found a lot of gold. A, by today's market standards, it would be $50 billion worth of gold. Um, yeah, I was thinking, and I like rounded to the nearest even. It might have been 55, but at that point... A billion here, a billion there. Like, yeah, yeah, you know it's a lot of money when give or take a billion doesn't really change anything. Um, so, and that was a century later. Um, wow. Yeah, <clears throat> so, yes, but he had a lot. And um, he was planning, at this point, he was planning an invasion of Greece because his first attempt had failed, or maybe his father's attempt, I can't remember. So that might have been part of why he was having this. But that's, that aspect's not really important for the Book of Esther. Um, if, the, if the author wanted to say... He had all these guys there to plan military stuff. The author would have told us that. That's not really the point. The point is that he's displaying uh, his wealth, which was great indeed. Okay. Um, this makes you wonder what they did all that time that they were there. <laughs> well, if you had $50 billion to show off, it might take a while. Um, I mean, that's a lot of days. There, I mean, like you said, they were they having meetings? Were they? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it doesn't. I mean, it doesn't say. So there's um, there's a lot of speculation, but um, uh, I'm sure there was planning going on historically, though that may not be important for the book. And uh, showing off your wealth was a way to get people to fight with you. If these were, you know, different nationalities all over the, the known world, I mean, from Ethiopia to India, that's a huge empire. Um, and all these, and that was back before nation states, so all these little cultures all over. Um, and he wants, he's planning a big invasion of Greece, which by the time the original audience was reading this, they all knew oh, that venture failed. <laughs> um, but, um, yes? Question. It was seven days for the feast, right? But it says it was 180 days yeah. of showing off. Most basically. scholars think, yeah, he invited them all there. Um, it's a big, uh, elaborate display of his wealth. I'm sure they were treated well. Mm -hmm. And then, the the grand finale was the seven day feast. Okay. So one hundred and eighty days and then the feast. Yes. The it's the the Hebrew is a little bit unclear. Um, that's why some translations have the feast lasting one hundred and eighty days. But most people think um, that that was the display. That's why the NIV translated it that way. For a full one hundred and eighty days he displayed his vast wealth. When these days were over he gave a banquet. That, so were they, they like went on tours <laughs> of the country? I mean, so that he could just I mean, his power. I think with his power. Yeah, and that involves not just cash, liquid, you know, treasure pile like Scrooge McDuck. It also is about military strength and animals and, uh, yeah. Well, one of the things you can possibly imagine that there had to be quite a bit of in some sort of governmental structure in his empire. And they didn't have modern methods of communication, so he probably had a lot of time to meet with individuals, talk about their problems and what they were doing. So you could imagine they could take quite a long time to do that. So anything I could imagine. Yeah, I mean, it's a like hundred... and UN meeting type of thing. Could he report you back with their area? 127 provinces, each with its own language and culture and translators. I mean, that would make sense. 
It would take a long time, yeah. yeah. Um, and to treat each one well, to show respect to each governor or whatever, yeah. Um, <clears throat> but, um, so, um, big key points is the wealth and the luxury. It's not just about military because it's describing the, the curtains and the colors of marble and all that. Um, and uh, a little theme that starts to emerge here is something like honor uh, or respect or admiration, something like that you're seeing right off the bat. Um, and then one other theme is, would be wine, uh, food and wine. That's going to, as we're going to see, that's going to come up again and again and again. Um, in this book. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah. Uh, now, I sort of, unfortunately, answered some of these things. Uh, why does he want to show off? Um, probably should just let that one sit on the table and think, what, could, what are the possibilities? Military advantage, ego. Um, there's some different possibilities. But uh, we'll come back and We'll reference that banquet and what we learn about his character from it. Uh, let's move on, 9 through 12. Someone else want to read 9 through 12? Queen Vashti also made a feast to the women in the royal palace, which belonged to King Asterisk. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was married with wine, he commanded, oh my goodness, you know what? Why don't you just um, say the first letter for each of their names? <laughs> Hold on. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, keep going. Okay, so impressions or questions about the story there in those verses. Why did he command all those men, I guess they were men, to go to the queen? I mean, there was like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <clears throat> you know, um, uh, everyone knows what a eunuch is? Okay. Cash uh, Bible, well, mine says chamber ladies. Well, a eunuch is a castrated man, um, and <clears throat> the only person ever, the only man who was ever going to be around the queen was going to be a eunuch. The king was very protective of his um, sexual rights or sexual property. Um, <clears throat> So um, and that, that concept is going to come up. So it's important. Um, it's actually a crucial concept uh, for this whole book. Um, why seven? Um, well, for one thing, uh, that physical, uh, physical military martial protection also. He wasn't going to let the queen be walking around without at least seven bodyguards. Of course, but he couldn't let any man who could potentially desire her um, near her. So You see what I'm saying? So he wants to show her off, but the people he has to send to be around her have to be eunuchs, uh, but it has to be several has to be a good amount because there's going to be a bunch of drunken men all looking at her. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. Why do you think he named them all? <laughs> there's a lot of speculation as to why he named them all. Um, 
uh, it's obviously the names are meaningless to us, uh -huh. and the characters don't show up again. Um, <clears throat> but um, yeah, it may have been that some of them they were important. Um, Unix were sometimes very important, uh, very high of officials in the government. Um, so they may have been known at the time. Just to make the point, you know, the, the Bible was written over uh, 1,400 years. And it was, it was trying to sell the concept of the monolith of God, you know, or Jesus. And they were trying to use names that people actually knew to add credence to what they were writing. And that's why they used some names. Because they thought, oh, I know that person. They're using Unix. So they were more accepted as being the truth as versus the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that, um, that does happen, um, especially in the New Testament when um, the audiences, when the books were written right after the events, you know, a couple decades after the events, you could go meet those people that actually saw it. So a lot of uh, eyewitnesses are named. Um, but anyway, um, other impressions from that little... There's a lot there, that little section. Well, when he says he called her wearing her royal crown, was that all she was supposed to be wearing? <laughs> uh, well, that is a, that's what the Jewish rabbis think. The ancient Jewish rabbis wrote down that they think that. Um, it's possible that they were doing what we have a tendency to do, which was jumping to a moral conclusion. Mm -hmm. um, it's also possible that they believe that because they hated their Persian overlord. Uh, we don't know. <clears throat> certainly doesn't. Certainly could have said made it more explicit. Um, this is a very purposeful. The reason isn't given. I mean, if she was supposed to just only wear a crown, um, the author doesn't want to make that obvious. Doesn't because because the Hebrew language has a word for naked. And he doesn't say that. Um, so that is a possibility. So as far as reasons why Vashti doesn't come, maybe it's that. Um, Jacob, yes. it says in that first verse 9 that she was making a feast for the women in the royal palace. Mm -hmm. um, so were they preparing the women for the men? Uh... I don't think so. Um, I think um, in Persia, women and men did feast together. And you might remember later in the book, Esther has a feast for you know, a, a couple men in the story. Um, so th th we don't know is the short answer. Um, I mean, there's a lot of people there. And even though the palace complex, what they call the citadel in some versions, is 200 acres. Um, in just in the the garden courtyard where they're having this, maybe there wasn't enough room for everyone, so the women had a separate thing. So they were just dressing for the party, so to speak. They were what? Just dressing up. Could they have the been party. wives of the men that he had? They could have been. Yeah. Um, yes. The, a lot of unanswered questions in this book. I would imagine most of the men are drunk. Well, that's what's good. Yes. Going to, going to, so their, their request may have been just out of bounds. You know, I mean, and it said it was where it was lying. You know, why, why be gawked at by a bunch of drunk men? Right. Yeah, especially um, because she'd have to go unveiled mm -hmm. for her beauty to be displayed. Mm -hmm. So even if it's just her face, the beauty of her face is supposed to be for her husband. So, option uh, <clears throat> number one is a noble option. It's the right thing. Mm, my beauty is supposed to be for him, even though I may not like him, that's what it's supposed to be for, and I'm not going to go let all these drunken men lust after me. Would that be in the themes? Um, yeah, or characters. It, um, Option number two, maybe she's just a stubborn, quarrelsome wife. Mm 
like Proverbs talks about. And she doesn't like to be ordered around. And she, you know, I don't care if my husband's the king. Um, or, option C, maybe her reasons are irrelevant. Uh, she's the king's property. Um, now, uh, the Greek historians who wrote about this, unfortunately we don't have any of the Persian historians. So we're, a lot of our history is from the Greek point of view. And the Greeks didn't really like the Persians. But the historical stuff we have says that there was only one free citizen in the Persian Empire, and that was the king. And everybody else was his slave. So, especially a wife. <clears throat> so, maybe it doesn't matter what her reasons are. If she disobeys, that is a big problem. Um, let's come back to her, what her reasons are before we just assume that it's uh, good or bad. Um, and let's talk about the king's reaction. What's the king's reaction to her refusing disobedience? He is angry. He burns with rage. Um, what does that tell us about the king? He had a temper. Good. Anger issues. <laughs> and, and what is making him angry in this situation? A woman dared. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um... I wonder if he would have been as angry if one of his servants, who was male, had defied him. Maybe. Yeah, it seems to be a power issue. This seems like now we we don't we don't know much about him yet, and we're going to get to know him more because he is probably the character with the most. FaceTime in this, if this were a movie, most screen time. Um, he's in like every scene. Could it, be a pride issue too, of her standing up to him. Yeah, um, this is a guy who seems like he needs to be in control, um, or at least feel like he's in control. Uh, we'll we'll see. Okay, let's move on. We got one last section, and I think we can finish it up or get to some of it. Um, uh, Lynn, would you like to read, um, oh, let's see what verse, uh, 13 through 22, the rest, the whole rest of the chapter? 13 to 22? Yeah, the rest of the chapter. Then the king said to the wise men who understood the times, for this was the king's manner toward all who knew law and justice, those closest to him being Ashina, Petra, Ericsson, and in the seven princes of Persia and Media, who had access to the king's presence and who ranked highest in the kingdom. What shall we do to Queen Vashti according to law because she did not obey the command of King Ahas... How do you say that? Ahas Ahasuerus. Okay. Brought to her by the eunuchs. And Memekin answered before the king and the princes. Queen Vashti has not wronged the king, but also all the princes and all the people who are in the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For the queen's behavior will become known to all women so that they will despise their husbands in their eyes when they report. King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought in before him, but she did not come. This very day, the noble ladies of Persia and Media will say to all the king's officials that they have heard of the behavior of the queen. Thus, there will be excessive contempt and wrath. If it pleases the king, let a royal decree go out from him and let it be reported in the laws of the Persians and the Medes so that it will not be altered, that Vasti shall come no more before King Ahasuerus and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. When the king's decree, which he will make is proclaimed throughout all his empire, empire for it is great, all wives will honor their husbands, both great and small. And the reply pleased the king and the princes, and the king did according to the word of Mukan. Then he sent letters to all the king's provinces, 
to each province in its own script, and to every people in their own language, that each man should be master in his own house and speak in the language of his own people. Okay. So, um, what basically happened there? I guess I'm surprised that he actually didn't just do something on his own and he actually consulted with, with his people. Yes, let's file that away for later. Okay. He didn't... Was you what, what we know of him so far, you expect him to just do something on his own, but instead he consulted with advisors. That's going to come up again. Okay. What else? What happened? Can someone sum that up in a few words? Well, it makes all the women submit to their husbands. What does? Uh, this command that he mm -hmm. just sent to them. Big decree to the whole empire. Good. <coughs> I just assumed that was understood. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Um, interesting. Uh, so. And to he, put it in the law. You know, I mean, they said during, it was his commandment. Yeah. So um, he goes to them and says, So what should be done to her according to the law? So you got, right? That's what he says. Mm -hmm. You got two options there. One is, he says, is there actually a law on the books that wives have to obey their husbands? I don't know. That was often him, he would come to them and be like, so the legal matters, right? Well, shouldn't he have done that? Look at 19. Uh, I mean, think about the president. There's a lot of laws that yeah. he probably has advisors to say. Well, technically in this case, blah, blah, blah. So that's one option is that he's actually going to them because he doesn't know whether or not there's actually a law about it. And if there's not, maybe there should be. Well, that's one possibility. That's uh, what he says in 19. If it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him and let it be written among the laws. Mm -hmm. So there must have been some kind of laws, maybe not related to that. But yeah, maybe this is unprecedented, yeah. yes. Um, um, also, to go to them and say, so according to the laws, you guys know all about the laws, what should we do to her? There's another possibility that he's not, it's not an honest question, uh, by saying, I don't know all the legality of this, but what should we do? Maybe asking about the legality is a way to cover up the fact that he doesn't know what to do about it. Right, because he was often going to them and saying, "So the laws, what, what is exactly the law in this case? Like, they brought spice, and we have a tax on spice, but the kind they have, you know, it's all complicated things, right?" Um, this one doesn't seem quite as complicated, but he still needs their advice. So, do you think that's maybe because he was in a pickle because he had pushed too far and she rebelled? But possibly maybe, and he was embarrassed, but maybe he loved her enough he didn't want to do that decree. Yeah. Lots of speculation. Yeah, and that's good. We need to do that. that is, all, everything you just said is definitely on the table. Um, and I think we can, we can find out some more. Um, Mamukin, uh, what's his basic advice? Just in a few words. Can anyone sum it up? Yes? Well, not yet. That's chapter two. Uh, he is, yeah, you're right. But just as far as right there. That she's done wrong, and you need to do something about it. Sixteen. Uh, and he gives two things he should do about it. Banish her. And pick and, and replace her. Yeah, banish her and replace her. And then what's the other thing that that edict will do? There's a law that's going to happen about Vashti, and there's a law that's going to happen about every household. In it, right? Mm -hmm. Those are the two basic laws they're making. She's going to get banished and replaced, and also, everybody has to. Are you surprised that he didn't have her killed? That's, what <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's what surprises me. Um, well, this is speculation, but it's a fitting punishment. It's like poetic justice. She won't come into my presence? Okay. She's not allowed to come into my presence. 
the presence of the king also happens to be a theme throughout this book. I know I'm giving stuff so away. So she still would she still live in the yeah. court? Is she still there, or did they banish her out of the court? Uh, um, well, she's basically assigned to widowhood. I mean, okay. if she, if she's still married to him, I don't know what their divorce laws were. Mm -hmm. If she's still married to him, she's never going to see him again. So, and if she's still in the palace it's going to be a lonely existence. And if she's out of the palace, her life is going to be, I don't know if she would go back to live with her family. Mm -hmm. um, not, it's not a good situation for her regardless. They just mentioned that, that she was never going to be seen by the king again. They weren't too specific about that. Yeah. But, it, but the, I think the key is, if she didn't want to come see you, then never let her see you. Um, and, she, and after at this point, from now on, they don't never refer to her as Queen Vashti. I think she probably had an idea that maybe he might forgive her, and that really that might be a backfire. Um, you'd think she would know him better than that, but but you know what? Actually, let's read ahead one verse because because there's some support for what you're saying. Uh, chapter two, verse one. Later. When the anger of King Xerxes, the NIV says, same name, later when King Xerxes, the anger of King Xerxes had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what he had decreed about her. There's definitely a note of regret in there. He's like, oh, now I don't have a queen. And that's when his advisors say, hey, why don't we do this, this contest? Even though I think they took it to, like verse 16 is talking and he says, this is Mamukin, mm -hmm. his name is, that she not only had offended the king, she had offended all the princes. Mm -hmm. That is very clever of Mamukin to say. Think about, he's got a very angry king in front of him and drunk. And he says, you know, this makes all of us mad. We're all in the same boat here. You're not the only one who looks like an idiot that can't control his wife. It's going to happen to all of us. So whether or not he really wanted to get a law like that on the books for his own personal household, um, it definitely helps the king feel like we're on the same team. We've got to do something about it. Yeah. <clears throat> not too different from the Arab countries today, is it? Yeah, they are... Yes. Um, yes, women... I don't know all the laws, but and it's, I'm sure it's different in different areas, but women typically are not allowed to drive. Um, so that really limits what they can do with their life mm -hmm. if you can't drive. Uh, and that's just one of the laws. It would be more pressure to feel like, you know, I've got all these people here, and when they're feeling like I need to do something, I need to do it whether you want to or not. Yeah, certainly there's some wounded ego going on. And he's very angry. Now, here's an important question. When does he make that decree? From chapter 2, verse 1, you should be able to figure out something about when he made it. From chapter 2, verse 1. And then he didn't write away? Yeah. He made while, he while he's still angry about it. Because mm -hmm. it's not until after the decree is made that he like, calms down from his anger. And probably still drunk. Definitely still angry. It says he's still angry. Um, and probably still drunk. Um, typical Persian custom was whenever you get, the king is going to make a law or, an, or a battle decision, um, you, if you make it when you're sober, then you write it down, get drunk, and see if you still agree. And if you make it when you're drunk, you write it down, and you wait till you're sober, and you read it, and you see if you still agree. And if you do, you do it. So all laws were supposed to have a drunken element. Um, it's a very bizarre practice in our minds. The one where if you make a decision while you're drunk, wait till you're sober, that one makes sense to us. Um, the other one uh, doesn't make as much sense, but um, there were cultural reasons for it which we don't have time to talk about. <clears throat> okay. It did go fast. So, um, 
Uh, let's see. <clears throat> so we know then that the king and his advisors, advisors, really the king, but in this case, it's all his advisors' idea, they made a hasty law which made him feel in control, right? She did that to you? Well, then you can, you can banish her and you can replace her with somebody better who's going to do what you say. Um, <clears throat> so this, this law that made him feel in control again, made him calm down, had two parts, one part about Vashti and one part about all women. Part A, about Vashti, he seems to regret later in, in chapter 2, verse 1. And part B, how is he going to enforce that? That every wife in the known world has to obey her husband. How is that? Not a lot of thought goes into the enforcement of that law. They're just like, let's just make it a law. And then it'll definitely happen. But then wouldn't each, um, each one of the province, provinces be in control of making sure that they all abide by And how would they do that? Would, it, would they say, okay, so we've got this office now, and if you're a man and your wife doesn't obey you, you can come and stand in line and give your complaint, and then we'll come and beat her a little bit for you? They didn't have cameras. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure they're just going to believe the husband. Right. But, like, what are they going to do that the man couldn't do already? You see what I mean? It's kind of a, a really stupid law. Um, and, and at least part of it he regrets afterwards. Um, <clears throat> so, um, the, yeah, I mean, he looks like a fool from his wife not obeying him, and then his response to it makes him look like more of a fool, although he doesn't know that. It makes him feel better, at least at the time. Um, <clears throat> okay, so... To finish, we've got a little bit of character analysis just starting to emerge, and we're going to learn getting to know the king a lot better, and some themes. Um, the king might not have good judgment on his own. He relies on his advisors, and he relies on his authority. Um, so those are some things we learned about the king. Um, the irony is that his advisors help him feel in control by kind of controlling him. Here's what you should do. Okay, good idea, I'll do it. I'll do whatever you came up with. Um, and then some themes, I would say, the biggest themes of chapter one are power and ego. With all the showing off, and then his ego is, is enraged uh, when his ego um, takes a hit. And lots of wine. And lots of wine and food. Uh, that's going to become important too. Lots of wine and food. Um, and we'll get back to why that's important as we get to know the king more. I have a question. Yes. Please. When they referred to all, the, all these guys coming were princes, at that point were those titles that were bestowed on their position? Um, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, in English, prince has been come to mean the son of a king. That's not what it means when you see it in the Old Testament. Um, it's like, if you heard of principalities? That's where it comes from. It means um, an official, a high-ranking official who has some kind of authority. Right. Jesus is the prince of peace. Does that mean his dad's the king of peace? And so he's like, well, someday I'll be the king of peace too. It means he's a, yeah, it's like a governor. It's a position. It's a position of authority. Um, well, I knew they weren't all actually his sons. But. Right, right. Yeah, I know. But it's just, it's not a clear word. Um, that's why the NIV has gone away from the word prince um, to translate that Hebrew word to uh, royal official or um, I forget what all it says. Um, nobles, officials, military leaders. That's, what it, that's the words it gives in the NIV. Um, so that's the general idea there. Good question. Um, nobles and officials and military leaders.
Any other final thoughts or questions?